Hi ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Living in SATV, David here. Today we are going to speak about a very controversial uh, mega project in South Africa, in Limpopo. Uh, so China is going to invest 145 billion rand in Limpopo. I don't know what to say, you guys will see and learn why Limpopo is so important for South Africa and uh, doing a project like this day, what will happen to all of us. Uh, again, uh, I want you to guys to stay until the end because I'm going to put a lot of curiosities about Limpopo. Our guest is also a, a very uh, knowledgeable about the situation, so stay tuned because this video once again blow your mind. Hi guys, welcome to another Living in SATV video, David here. Uh, today we have a very special uh, guest. We're going to speak with uh, Miss Makoma Lekala Kala, which is the director behind Earth Life Africa here in Johannesburg. And this is the, literally our first official podcast where we talk about environmental protection in South Africa. Makoma, how are you? Good day. Um, thank you very much for hosting me and looking forward to our conversation. It's only a pleasure. Very, we're going to speak about today a very controversial uh, subject, which is the mega project in Limpopo, which you guys have been asking me about for ages. So uh, Makoma is a right person to speak with because uh, she knows exactly what's going on. So she is the best person to explain to us how this will impact Limpopo um, environment. Uh, but first of all, let me just read you a little bit about the background bio of uh, Ms. McComb because it's impressive. So the director of Earth Life Africa Johannesburg, an environmental justice and anti-nuclear organization. Makoma is a strong campaigner for a just and fair society. Her commitment to climate justice in South Africa has led civil society to win the first South African climate change legal court case against the government and the reversal of nuclear deal by the South African and the Russian governments. For her efforts, she received a WWF Living Awards Honorable Mention in 2017, the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa in 2018, and the Nick still environmentalist of the year 2018 amongst other accolades recently appointed to the presidential climate change coordinating committee body tasked in advising the president on process of a just transition to a low carbon development this is really impressive Macomb, i must say the first question will be Please explain to us what Earth Life Africa does. Earth Life Africa is an environmental justice organization that started way back in 1988. And um, we work to uh, we work in partnership with um, ordinary people so that um, people can be part of the decision-making processes and bring about change that would protect the environment. We also um, encourage business to also do the right thing in making sure that their business does not harm uh, the environment. Perfect. So the second question will be, is the South African youth aware of nature protection initiatives? I would say that um, young people are aware However, I think they need to get um, leadership or examples from the older generation. Young people are aware since this is part of what they learn uh, from the school curriculum, but uh, in our homes, we have to do better to encourage young people to take much more of the environment. And that can be done in different ways. Um, the intergenerational dialogues where adult people would be able to share stories of when they grew up, what was around them, what was happening, that could be an influence to young people to see that uh, the current situation, it's not really what would people would say, this is life enjoyable, or this is what they can be able to be for. Uh, for an example, um, we need to discourage our young people around consumerism. Um, young people today, 
they only see or they are much more influenced by mass media on consumerism uh, because our mass media it's not really sensitive to environmental protection and this is something that we really need to to bring up but then conversations with young people um also uh, being exemplary living exemplary from like for an example uh having our micro gardens uh, energy efficiency so this becomes a perfect example young people around us to say this is how things to be uh, have got to be done but also put an explainer as to why we have to conserve energy put an explainer to them as to why is it important for us to use water sparingly and grow our own food those are the little things that we can uh, use or make to encourage young people to be much much aware of the environment and also be part of protecting the environment. But, oh, however, we know that there's a divide between the urban youth and the rural youth. Those who have lived in establishments, in families, in communities where nature is protected, you find that those young people are much more aware and are uh, involved in protecting the environment around them. Uh, and those who live in areas where consumerism is at its best, that's when you see that uh, people don't have an idea at all, but it's up to us as older people to be exemplary and also to encourage young people to be able to take care of the environment. Already, as seats, uh, people are young people are already into environmental protection and you find others also being conscious of the kind of clothes that they wear as to whether is this biodegradable material, do I have to go um, every month or every three months to a shop to buy? Why don't I get recycled clothes from either parents or from either families? And so, so there's so, so much that can be done. And uh, I think um, the reuse, recycle um, notion would be best if that is being inculcated on young people. And that is part of saving the environment. Maybe just to further on say that um, we have also the best legislation. We've got what you call the National Environmental Management Act, and that act also um, takes into consideration uh, the harm that has been caused to the environment in the past. And it says uh, one of the section talks about the polluter pays principle. That means if you have harmed the environment, you have um, to um, a remedy or, or you have to remedy or correct the situation. And when it says polluter pays, doesn't mean that you pay in money, in rents, but also in action, that um, rehabilitation becomes very important if um, there has been um, uh, actions of, um, or whether through business that are harming the environment. Um, so people, um, uh, so, so that principle of polluter pays, it's, it's, it's a universal principle that I think is recognized uh, in most part of the world. But in South Africa, this is what really uh, pins down and uh, that gives us indication that uh, you are not supposed to harm or bring about harm to the environment that it's so beautiful that gives us life and that, is, that, that, that gives us life and that also uh, takes care. Of, of, of us as, as a human species and also takes care of the environment and what we need, whether it's rivers, whether it's hills, whether it's mountains, whether it's plants. And this is, um, uh, I think, the core of um, how brilliant and how good the environmental legislation are in the country. However, we see that sometimes there is no implementation. Sometimes uh, people ignore this kind of uh, um, what 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 is enshrined in our constitution and that's why you find uh, activists uh, all over south africa who are standing up either holding the government accountable exposing industries that are causing harm and also encouraging other people to take action in protecting the environment because that's the basis of where our legislation uh, focuses on very well very well okay so what in your opinion is environmental justice 
environmental justice is the notion that um, each and every person has got the right to be part of decision making processes that um, are in relation to the environment around them. And those decision making processes obviously would be in favor of the people and also would be in favor of um, the territories overall that are around us. That is, environmental justice would speak to um, how the env environment is of benefit to the people, how the rivers need to be protected, how our plants need to be protected. Let me say overall how our biodiversity needs to be protected. And um, so environmental justice means that uh, all of us um, would have to be part of decision-making processes to ensure that there is no harm in, uh, in, in, in our environment. Perfect. Now we're going to go to the um, the questions about the mega project in Limpopo, which is called the Musina Makado uh, Special Economic Zone. So the uh, the first question for uh, for you in in this subject is, why is the Chinese government so interested in creating this SEZ in Limpopo? Um, I think we know all of us that. Um, the China has got what is called a Belt Road Initiative, and whereby they have taken an example of um, an industrial zone in, in China, which they want to replicate in other countries. But um, we see this also as another form of, of colonization by the Chinese. Um, in South Africa or in Africa, we have uh, different kinds of colonization that have taken place. But this one by the Chinese is actually um, much more explicit because it comes in a form of what is called so-called development. But that so-called development, it's not the real development that people need because it's an imposed on them. And with the Muxina Makado Special Economic Zone, uh, we understand that the Chinese have got a major uh, shareholder stake in the project. And uh, that project is... Um, it's, it's the side of the project. It's in one of the most biodiverse areas of the country in the Limpopo Valley uh, between Musina, Musina Town and Makaru Town. And um, in this area of Musina Makado, where the identified site is, this is one of the pristine areas that you'd find in the country where biodiversity so um, uh, 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 evident, where in this area you find that there's a uh, baobao trees, uh, ancient baobao trees, which are woven into people's cultures and traditions in the area. You find that there's the uh, marula trees, which are also part of um, food security, also part of traditions, uh, the festivities of the people around the area. And you also found the Mopani trees, which are a source of food for the people. And all this at this time to be uprooted. And there's no any other area in South Africa where you can go and uh, relocate or replant these trees in. So in a way, uh, because of these trees, they, they are woven into people's cultures and traditions. You find that the sacred sites also around the area, you find also that there's ancestral graves around the area, and this are all are going to be desecrated for the expense of the profit that would be gained much more by the Chinese. And this is not on, this is in violation of um, South Africa's um, international commitment on biodiversity protection, this is also will add um, uh, about 16% of the current budget of South Africa. And worse, it's going to uproot the people's uh, cultures and traditions. That is, the people would no longer know who they are because what is identified or what they identify with is just going to be destroyed. The, Area of Musina Makaro is also uh, the fruit uh, the food basket, the winter food basket of, of the country. So when this plant comes by, the cumulative impacts around of, that would come from um, this coal fired power station that would come around um, the metallurgical plants that are going to be established there, that would mean that um, um, water is going to be diverted 
still uh, these plants, people would not have water, and the emissions that are going to come out there are going to be around 16% of the, the South African current budget. While South Africa has committed itself to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so this cannot go on. The other thing is that um, the coal-fired power plant there, it's not even budgeted on the integrated resource plan, which is a planned energy plan for the country for the next 20 to 30 years. It's not budgeted. So this is kind of um, a violation uh, or also or overlooking what the country has set itself about. But what is much more alarming is that uh, the Nimpopo Economic Development and Tourism Agency, which is the provincial uh, department of uh, the Department for Forestry, uh, Fisheries and Environment, is actually in the lead of, um, of, of promoting this special economic zone. So we're using legislation in the country, we're using the regulations in the country, we, we're using policies in the country to challenge Special economic zone. Uh, if we let it go ahead, uh, we'd we'll be complicit of um, a climate disasters that are taking place. Already, we know that um, around the Zimbabwe, Mozambique, there has been people have experienced climate-induced natural disasters of flooding in the past years. So. Um, if we add on our carbon budget, that means we'll be exacerbating uh, the problem further. And we cannot allow this to happen as, as South Africans. We cannot let this happen as people all over the world. This is not only happening in Muslim Akaro, it's also happening in other parts of, of, of the continent. And as people in the continent, we are in solidarity. We cannot allow the Muslim Akaro special economic zone go ahead. We cannot allow the coal mines that the Chinese want to open in, in, in Zimbabwe to go ahead. We cannot let projects like um, the East Africa crude oil uh, pipeline go ahead. We cannot let um, uh, to have um, uh, the nuclear, the proposed nuclear power stations in different countries of, of Africa. In that way, it would be that we are actually um, being complex to the increasing temperatures uh, in Africa that are so high. So we would be, it seems like we have not felt um, uh, the wrath of, of, of negative climate change impacts on, on our lives. Currently, we live in the Southern African region is drought stricken and um, so food insecurity becomes an issue. And the heat is going high, uh, very, um, the temperatures are increasing continuously. So that would mean that also what we live from, from the land, um, the plants are no longer uh, producing like they were. I mean, now lately there has been a research around uh, Murula plant, uh, Murula and Mopani plants, and it has been uh, established that um, the crops are actually diminishing because of climate change. So the Musina Mercado Special Economic Zone has a much more higher impact than any other project that has been done in South Africa. And worst of all, it's that, it's that if, if it goes ahead, it will be in violation of what we stand for and what the country actually has committed itself to do in eradicating poverty and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Perfect. Thank you very much. The second question in this subject will be why the South African government was going to allow this SEZ to happen? What do we have to win? Like you said, we have nothing to win. So why making something like this? Um, I think for now, we, we, we're going through what is called the environmental impact assessment um, processes, uh, which are required by law for any uh, project that is going to, um, or that is proposed in any other area. And we're using the South African um, legislation because this is part of what needs to happen. And uh, from all what has been taking place, what is being proposed, and some of the reports of the environmental impact assessments are actually not in favor of, of the project. Um, we don't have now, because by law, there's supposed to be specialist studies around various issues. 
And um, in this environmental impact assessment, we see that uh, there's a lot of missing specialist studies. There's a gaps in missing in, in specialist studies. So it tells us from the way to go that that's, this is not going to happen. Um, we have written letters um, to the Ministry of um, uh, Fisheries, uh, Forestry and Environment, highlighting um, that there's this project that is um, being proposed and there's an environmental impact assessment that is being that is in process and we wanted to know from the minister as to what their views are and the minister has not yet responded um i wrote to the minister of um of, of environment and the minister of uh, trade and um, of trade and industry they also have have not um responded they just acknowledged the letter not responded. So we are going to, to, to go ahead and use the country's legislation, regulations, and policies in challenging uh, this special economic zone. And um, in the past weeks, um, I have been part of a, a process uh, where the people who own the land of Malombani had actually done what they call an ecological mapping. And that was a very powerful um, mapping exercise where we had um, um, the elders of that community um, interacting with the adults in the community, with the youth in the community and children, and just mapping out. And that was part of everyone knowing their history. That was part of everyone understanding where their elders come from. And that was another way of saying, um, imparting on the young people the importance of that land, the importance of um, the sacred sites in the area, the importance of um, the ancestral graves, culturally, what does that mean to everyone? So it was a very empowering exercise. And um, this is another reason why this special economy zone should be challenged and not be allowed to go ahead. The Malawani people need to decide really what they want to do, which already they have um, ideas of what they want to do to increase um, the food basket to farm in the area, to still keep the ecological balance, to still be able to visit their sacred sites and perform rituals there, to still be able to go to their ancestral grave sites and also perform rituals there as um, the vendor people um, are practice. So there's so many other reasons why this Musina Makaro Special Economic Zone cannot go ahead. It's, if it goes ahead, it's stripping the people of their rights to um, religion, uh, their rights to uh, practice their, their rituals, their right to food security, and their right of identity. So me it doesn't make sense and uh, environmentally if this happens it will be a, a destruction of the ecological balance of the area and that destruction of the ecological balance is not only going to be felt around that area it's going to have accumulative impacts um, in the surrounding areas and one of the uh, two of the areas is the Mapungubie um, heritage site, which is internationally recognized, which is not far from uh, the site. The other is um, the one of the South African as uh, the biggest South African national parks, which is shared by Zimbabwe and, uh, and Mozambique. So the destruction is much, much more than um, what one can see with, 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 with like the naked eye around the area. But the accumulative impacts are just going to be much, much more bigger because it's going to impact um, other countries uh, around South Africa. What South Africans can do to prevent this man-made natural disaster to happen? What can we do as normal citizens um, besides being informed? How can we spread I think first and, first and foremost is that uh, South Africans all over the country uh, will have to be on guard that uh, this kind of projects are not proposed or are not brought into their areas. Um, we may be talking about Musina Makaro now, and we know that there's a lot of prospecting for oil and gas in the country, so, and in people's lands. And um, I think what we need to do is just to make sure that uh, 
uh, we ensure that all South Africans uh, realize the um, constitutional rights, particularly um, that each and every one of us has got to live in an environment that is not harmful to their being. Um, secondly, is that we need to hold our government accountable. Um, our government has made international commitments around um, a climate change that they would want to um, um, uh, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And by doing so, so there should be mitigation, no um, projects that are going to in uh, uh, increase the carbon budget of the country should be allowed. And already this has been done, um, I think Ethlaf Africa, and together were at SLF Africa, together with the people of Lipala and Limpopo, we have taken government to court around um, their commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions when the South African government had um, authorized um, for the construction of um, a coal fire power plant called Kabameti, which was largely um, going to be financed by the Japanese. And when we took the government to court, it became a five-year battle in and out of court. And finally, um, that um, the government of South Africa acceded to the fact that, uh, yes, they cannot go ahead with this um, uh, authorizing this plant. So this plant was set aside. So already there's an example of what ordinary people can do. Um, but moreover, people should hold their own municipalities also to account. If municipalities said they've got independent development plans or programs, integrated development programs, and that should not include um, uh, projects that are not sustainable, projects that are going to bring about harm to the environment in that particular area. Yes, jobs can be created. Those are short-term jobs, but uh, it's not decent jobs. If you really want a decent job, a decent job cannot be about desecrating your own uh, forefathers or your four bearers graves. Um, a decent job cannot mean that you um, are destroying your sacred science. That's not a decent job. A decent job would be that job that is uh, not going to cause harm to the environment, is not going to cause harm to your being. That job that would also uh, recognize and um, protect who you are and the environment around you. So that's what South Africans can do to be aware that um, the law doesn't allow that and they should never ever allow any projects that is going to be harmful to their being or bring about um, uh, uncomfortable uh, or, ch or change their, their environments into uncomfortable environments that they may not be able to live in. South Africans can also hold the government accountable. The government has made um, um, commitments around uh, the protection of biodiversity. And this is kind of a recent you know, commitment that they have done. Besides all the good legislation that we have in the country, we need to hold them accountable to that. If this thing comes, and that's what we're doing. We're saying you have signed the biodiversity protocol you are part of the International United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations, and you have made commitments there. So walk your talk, live to that. And all what we can do as South Africans is to push so that, because we already are living in an environment that's not harmful, for example, that is harmful for being. For example, the people that are living in the high felt region of South Africa, Malasheni and Pumalanga, um, uh, have an intensity uh, 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 in an everyday, have an intensity struggle to breathe. And um, it's because of the deadly air in that area that the Council of Geosciences a few years ago had said that the air in this area is the most poisonous in the world. And you find people around um, Sasol, uh, Ferenaheim, who also are in that struggle of the intensity to breathe. And because of... Uh, um, the, the, the industries around that area, which mostly are of the legacy of the past. So we need not repeat the mistakes of the past. We have a, a government which is uh, a government of the people. So it's up to us to hold them accountable to ensure that all legislations that we have, regulations and policies are implemented. They don't just remain on paper, because if they're on paper, they will dry and be beautiful. We can refer to them while 
you know, what was supposed, to, what were those legislation or what those legislation were supposed to happen, they don't happen. So holding governments accountable is quite important. But I must say that you can hold the government accountable. It is important for you to also act, act in such a manner that you don't create a future that is unbearable for the coming generation. What you do in your household, what you do when you go out, and that would um, uh, create a better life. And acting doesn't only mean that you hold the government accountable, like I'm saying, you also do things that would improve um, the environment if it's in a bad state of where you live. Thank you very much, Makoma. Last question, how can people follow your organization's work? I normally say that um, if you want to follow our organization's work, act where you are. If in the area where you are, you see there's water pollution, from that water pollution, make sure that you contact the relevant people, you have people's meetings where people would be able to talk and, and, and say whether they, they would like to have that water, water polluted or something has got to be done. So it should be people's action. So that's the best way to follow our organization, firstly. Secondly, following our organization is uh, also being part you know, of the movement um, that advocates um, for, for environmental justice. And that movement, it's not only EarthLife, there's a lot of organizations out there locally. And the best thing for you to do is to act at your, at your, at, at your individual level. And acting at your individual level would actually make sure that you become part of the movement of changing, of uh, moving from business as usual to what's just a future. However, if one is interested about some of the work we do, you can visit um, our website, uh, which is www.athlife.johannesburg.org.za. And uh, you can also connect with us on social media, which is uh, uh, Twitter, Athlife Johannesburg, and Facebook, Athlife Johannesburg. And we really appreciate people letting us know what they're doing in their area, rather than wanting belong to Life Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting to listen to you, Makoma. Thank you very much. Uh, and again, uh, don't forget, uh, we as citizens, we need to participate more um, in, in the things that have been uh, happening in our country and contribute. That's what I'm saying. Contribution, your contribution is so important. You have something to say. So be aware of yeah, it. That's, that's why I was saying that environmental justice means that everyone uh, becomes part of the decision-making processes around the environment. And that means that if you become part of decision-making processes, you contribute, you participate, you become part of the processes, whether in developing policies, whether in influencing legislation, but much more in setting an example of what needs to happen. Thank you. Okay, Makom, thank you so much once again. This was another Living in Essay podcast, guys. Don't forget to smash, subscribe, destroy that like button, and see you in the next Living in Essay TV podcast. Okay, guys, thank you very much for staying until the end. I hope you guys learned a lot. Uh, please tell me your opinion in the comments down below. I will also leave a lot of links so you guys can learn more about this project uh, and um you know see you in the next living essay video and destroy that like button once again